Morning, everybody out there in Wright Robinson world. We've got Kian Bryan with us this morning, ex Wright Robinson student, obviously, and now professional footballer Sheffield United. Morning, Kian. Morning. Uh, Kian's with us this morning because this is a, a precursor, if you like, for next week's sports presentation awards. We would normally have an evening, but obviously it's been cancelled this year due to the uh, coronavirus and the lockdown. And as Kian is a former school colours winner, and a great ambassador for the college. We thought we'd have a chat with him this morning about school life and about uh, becoming a professional footballer and all things Wright Robinson and uh, now all things Sheffield United and Bolton Wanderers at the moment. So, first of all, Kian, I've got to congratulate you, you and Brooke, on the birth of your son, Max. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's hard work, but we're enjoying it. Is he a sleeper? Yeah, we used to be fair. During the day, I'm not too sure about night. It was the most important. So, he's having a good sleep at night, which helps us a lot. Okay, but hey, you're lucky. You've done better than me there then. So it took me uh, 10 <laughs> years to get mine to sleep. So congratulations yeah, on that one. Okay. Um, we're going to lead into it straight away, really, with a little bit. You, you start right, Robinson, if you remember. Was it 2008? You probably cashed yeah. your back. So you yeah, could... Time ago. What primary school did you go to? I went to Sacred Art in Gorton. Um, that was where a lot of my family went. So and obviously I lived in Gorton, so it was local. So, yeah. And do you play football for Sacred Heart, obviously, yeah? Yeah, we played, um, we played, we used to wear the Celtic kit, funny enough, um, it was good times, we we had a good team, I had my cousin Dylan Norris playing as well. Yeah, yeah. Older, but I used to play up, so it was good, I enjoyed it. All right, but so you start year seven and then we're going to talk football really, not academia to start with, but uh, pretty much when you when you come to Wright Robinson, you're straight into the trials, aren't you? First week, second week, you remember that? Yeah. Yeah, and for me, it, it was always a big thing because I had a lot of family members that went to the high school, so um, they always used to tell me about playing for school football teams and how good it was and how much they enjoyed it. So I knew straight away how, how much I wanted to play for the school team. And at that time, I, I wasn't playing for Man City or the team professionally, so I kind of had to prove myself just like anybody else. So when I went in, I was nervous, as the same as any, any other kid would be. Um, obviously, you go out onto the pitch, you have your pee, you get on and stuff, and you get ready to do the trials and you don't want to try too hard, but you obviously you want to impress you and whoever was the coach at the time. Um, and for me, when you come back into the B show and you sat down and you get told whether you've been picked or not, it's, it's a nerve-wracking time. But um, I was buzzing to be picked um, and obviously you go home and tell your family that you've been picked for the team, you're buzzing. Yeah, I mean, I've got to say, and I'll say this now because we've obviously we've got some, the year sixes will be joining us in September as year sevens. Yeah. I think they've got to be the hardest school trials in the country. I think we have some like 140 boys Come down for those trials. It's not an easy yeah. pass to get on that. There was, there, was a, there, was a lot of, there was a lot of us um, that went. And I remember, obviously, at the time, you, you don't really know many people because it's very early on in the year when you do the trials. So it was kind of just your primary school friends that come to the school, if they do come to the school um, that you're with. So I remember sticking with my cousin, Anthony Lufford. Um, he, was, he obviously went to my primary school and we just kind of, we ended up playing together up front, funny enough. Um, so, yeah, it was good for me because he had someone there who I could speak to and just kind of relax around and I already played football with him. I can't remember who the staff were. It would have been me, Mr. Howshaw. Was Mr. Haycock around then, possibly? And... Um, I'm not sure. I just I just remember you and Mr. Howshaw, to be fair. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, we, we pick a team, don't we? Year seven. And I, you know what? I'm six in my mind. I'll give you what the six in my mind. Because we did well. I think we won the Manchester Cup and the County Cup that year. Yeah, yeah. A big bugbear for me, and I have a few of these over my career with the with the football teams. Is we got knocked out of the English schools, I think it was somewhere in Ormskirk, if you remember, and it was an absolute farce. We went over somewhere. It was on the it was Merseyside way, Ormskirk, Merseyside, and it yeah. was early doors. It was only about three weeks, and I think we only just picked a team. And I don't remember getting one decision. I mean, I know that sounds like I'm being bitter now. But we it was got, always weird. You went to Liverpool, though. Oh, yeah. So we got we got tipped out of the uh, of the English schools. And then you start to think, because that's the first competition, you think, well, how good is this team? How good is this set This set of players? And obviously, and then on, I don't think we lost again probably that season. I think we went on and we won the County Cup and we won the Manchester Cup. Is that, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. We won the Manchester Cup and the County Cup. I remember it used to be played, was it Parswood, wasn't it? Where it was played yeah. in the finals. So um, I remember driving down there and then obviously looking back now, we went there quite a few times over the years. And But that first one was special because obviously that's, when you hear about the other year groups and it's kind of a competition within the school of the year group. So you always want to prove that your year is the best one. And I think we did well. Yeah. yeah. So I can't remember what it was like with that year, when you were in year seven, but 
traditionally it was always a great feeling for the staff as well because we'd usually have three or four teams in the final. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'd just arrive in a sea in red and black down at Paws Wood off yeah, the cop. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Or a, a bus, loads <laughs> of buses just one by one. <laughs> and everyone would be going right, obviously, in the room. You could see that by that stage we got a reputation. There's a little bit of fear. When, when we got off the bus, you could see people thinking, oh, no. That it's game on now. We're right, obviously, they've arrived. So yeah, they knew it was in for a game if we turned <laughs> up. <laughs> they were great days. So year seven finishes, and it, traditionally in those years, with those days, I used to take the year sevens. If you set the year sevens up, then somebody else would run for them and run with the team going forward. So that's when you started your relationship with Mr. Howshaw, really. And really. That that would became um, unprecedented because he ended up taking you through all the way through to the end of year eleven, didn't he? Yeah, and obviously you'll know this, but I'm not sure that normally happens. Normally every year you change managers, don't you? Well, pretty much but, so. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's not stupid. He realised they had the best team, so that's why. <laughs> um, but no, Mr. Howshaw was great with me and I still have a good relationship with him now. We still text and ask how each other's kids are and things like that. It's more of a grown-up relationship now than what it was back in school because obviously he was a teacher and he had his strict side with everybody, but um, he, was a be- he, was, he was a very good man. Um, always looked out for us and obviously I had sisters at the high school as well and I think he was ahead of the year of uh, Shuri yeah. or Chantel, I think. So, obviously, he had a relationship with my mum and things, which helped. Um, so, yeah, it was good and I appreciate him a lot. So, you did well. So, we'll, we'll, obviously, we'll start by saying that you went on, you won the Manchester Cup and County Cup, I think, uh, eight, nine and ten. And you won, you won the Manchester League in that time. But there were a couple that got away. Not that, not to go not to on the negative, but let's let's go through to... Um, I'll, I'll do, see if I can do a screen share now. This is going to get technical, Kian, but I reckon the... I think I can pull this yeah, up. Right. Uh, I was gonna, I was gonna ask you to name the team first, wasn't I? But let's see if I can get it on. Maybe not. All right, I'll get it on in a minute. Before it's I honest. get it on, can you can, on. can you name the team from the final, from the national final in year nine? Can, 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 before we, uh, before I put it up, then I mean I've, I've had a chat with Mr. Alshaw and we've been digging through the archives, so we we, we didn't nail it straight away, but. I think, I think I've, I think I have got it. Um, Jabril was the net. Yeah. And then at right back we had Connor Hutchinson. Yeah. Um, centre half was Big Albert Keeling. Yeah. Um, Elliot Julian. Yeah. Uh, Matthew Marshall. Yeah. Um, in the centre pitch we had Callum McGlynn. Yeah. Um, with Kai Muldoon. Um, yeah. Damien St. Louis on the right. I know, yeah, Damien St. Louis, right? We, 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 he was one that we couldn't catch. We, we have a Damien down, or you'll see on the list, but we didn't have him down as a start in 11. Go on, who else was in there? Um, he did start, I remember. Um, did he? Yeah, I think so, anyway. Um, then Devan A was out wide on the other side. Yeah. And then there was me and Anthony Lufford up front. Right, so we've got you and, uh, well, I'll show you now what we have, but we've got it wrong. We had, uh, <laughs> we had you and Medi up top. And Anthony on Medi, the bench. Medi, come on. Did he? Yeah. But, so That's we have that as a tweet. We have that. So obviously, a few changes on there. So 21st of March 2011. You know what? In hindsight, sometimes you get indication of how things are going to pan out. I think we got the away dressing room, didn't we? Yeah, we did actually. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure we did. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we're a mile and a half from the ground. They're all city fans, and we get the away dressing room. So you start <laughs> to think straight away. This, is, this isn't going to pan out like we wanted yeah. it to. Things were um, against us from the, from the get-go, weren't they? Yeah. So, but good experience. So, we, I'm, I'm going to say this now. It's not, I know, I know you won't, you won't, you, you, this isn't your personality, but you must have been particularly gutsy because you scored a hat-trick in the final, right, and end up on the, end up on the losing side. You must be thinking, how's, how's that happened, you know? Yeah, I still have my friends that I speak to now that was playing at the time. How have you just let me lose this game after scoring a hat-trick? But um, for me, it was such a strange day because obviously I scored a hat-trick at the Etihad and I was obviously buzzing, my family was buzzing and I think some of my teammates was buzzing for me, obviously. But um, we went out, out on the losing side and it was the way it, we went out as well with what happened at the end. It was just devastating. That double dribble of, uh, of Devontae's. Yeah, I thought he was... Play- I think he thought he was playing basketball. Yeah, that double dribble killed it for us. We got ourselves back in the game, and then he decided to, you know, to scoop it up and run out with Devonte. Bless yeah. him. I've seen him a couple of times since, and I mentioned that to him. He just says he just has that right grin that he always used to have. So, uh, yeah. but it was one of those. Good, yeah. uh, I mean, good good side, some good players in that team. 
Yeah, we had some very good players, to be fair. We had, um, obviously, Devante was at Blackburn at the time. We had um, me, obviously, was at City. Um, then there was a few just kind of around that level where they didn't just quite get into academies. Callum was at um, Burnley at the time. Um, but, yeah, like I said, there was a few that was at the level where they just couldn't make that extra step up. But we had a very good team. And, obviously, in that final, we played against that lad who, I think his name was Jeremy Bovo, who played at Chelsea. So, they had a very good team as well. So, he but, um, still, um, he's still playing, you know, now. And he plays for, uh, did a bit of research on this, Sassuolo in Sierra A. Yeah, and I've seen that Chelsea, have, um, they've got a buyback clause in him. So I heard in the papers the other day that he could be going back there. So that just shows how good he was. I, I think I think in hindsight, and I haven't said this to Mr. Osho even, but looking at some of the, in, in back on through the archives, they must have had an agreement with, with Chelsea, that school team, because he, he'd been signed from Birmingham City. And, uh, uh, Jeremiah at Boga, yeah, and you don't move from Birmingham, then just suddenly land in, a, in any random school. They must have put yeah. him in Chelsea. And I think what he would be fair to say <clears throat> to you and to that group is that under the current uh, PlayStation Cup rules, the current ESFA rules, you'd have won that cup probably that year because it's split now. So they have a competition where if you're in an academy, everybody can play as many academy players, and they have another one now where you're limited to three, and that would have suited us. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, because we only had two of freedom, yeah. yeah. We'd have won it because they probably had six or seven at Chelsea in that team that day. Yeah, definitely. Another, another kid, um, Ryan Sweeney, who scored on the day, and he plays for Mansfield. Have you ever come across him? Yeah, I've heard of him, actually, yeah. Was he the centre-half? Uh, uh, he was just on the team list because I looked through to see... Yeah, I've heard of him, him, yeah. And he, and he yeah. was on it. Uh, wouldn't be remiss of us, we'd be remiss of us not to mention Gibral, wouldn't it? I mean, the smallest goalkeeper... Ever to play for Wright Robinson. I mean, he did the best he could in those big goals, didn't he? Yeah, Gibril was obviously he was he was a great character. He was good to have in the dressing room, but um, he, he he just wasn't a goalkeeper. Let's be honest, he was he was a very good lad, but he just did like he said the best he could for us, and we didn't have anyone else to play next, so he did everything he could for us, and yeah. that's the kind of type of person he was. He'd do anything for anybody to grow. He certainly was a character. I remember him jumping in the swimming pool when we went on football tour, and he couldn't swim. We had to <laughs> fish him out. <laughs> Doesn't surprise me with him. So, uh, so we we lose in year nine, and then in year ten we're lucky we get beat in the semi final. I think. Would you remember that? Yeah, I remember that. Um, was that was that a team from Nottingham? I don't know. Was it from Nottingham or from Blackburn? Did we play? I don't remember if we played something like Hyde United or some 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 strange ground for that one. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not that. sure, but I just remember the feeling after because obviously we got to the final the year before. It was kind of like we was going back in, and Mr. Howshaw was saying, "It's our year. Let's do it." And We've got the team to do it. We're obviously older, a bit more experienced, and we know what to expect. And it just obviously was heartbreaking that day when we didn't beat the team in the semis. Yeah. And then year 11, we just got a bit disjointed, didn't we? <clears throat> it didn't quite pan out as, it, as we would have liked, but we'd had four good years with the team, really, haven't we? Yeah, well, it was a, it was, um, it was an unfortunate situation, ending-wise. Um, but looking back as a whole, like my time through school football, it was, I'd do anything to go back and play for school. Um, it was freedom. You enjoyed every time you went out on the pitch with, it, with the lad, it was your friends. So for me, it was special because when you go to City, you're, you're playing with your friends, but they're not your friends from school. It's a completely different relationship. And it's, it's so good to go out there with the likes of Callum and Kyle and players that twin, um, Matthew Marshall, that I used to be with them every day. So to play football with them and go away, on away trips and things like that, it was it was great memories looking back. Just just on the Marshall brothers, <clears throat> you'll know a bit better than me on this one. Just, I'm sure all the kids that are listening will be interested in this. But they've carved an interesting career out for themselves, haven't they? Yeah, very interesting. Um, they are living the life. They're in America playing um, a game called Call of Duty. Um, it's basically a uh, game in... It's a gun game kind of thing but um, they've done it professionally so they've done very well they've moved out to America both from it just uh, Matthew that started at the time and then he got his brother into it and it's just basically the the companies have taken off so they're doing very well for themselves well listen send them our best wishes yeah well <clears throat> okay so at school from a sporting perspective uh, disgusting to, to some extent really but you signed for City start of year 7 wasn't it it was really early on wasn't it yeah, it was it was really early on because I remember going to the trials and then it wasn't long after that I signed for City at their trials. So I kind of had a bit of experience with trial situation. So it was good. <clears throat> That's your one that got away from me because I tried to sign you for Blackburn, didn't I? After the trial, that, that first trial, I said, I said, do you want to sign? And 
in keeping with tradition, we didn't have the paperwork available at the time. The city got in and uh, and then the, yeah, I remember that he was on to me to get, for getting me down to Blackburn, but um, I think I had my heart set on City. Yeah, no, no, and, you, and to be fair, you went through the ranks all the way through at City, didn't you? Yeah, so I started when I was, I think, it, yeah, I would have been 11, um, and then I left when I was 21, 20, so I had a good 10 years there. I had the experience that, that I got to to witness over my time there, travelling away to Hong Kong, all parts of the world, so literally it was some of the best times of my life, that's it, yeah. And you became a bit of an ambassador for me, I mean, <clears throat> Patrick Vieira clearly rated you as a footballer, because every time we opened the newspaper and there was something on from the academy, we say, OK, I was in the paper. So, um, and you, you know, obviously, you must have had a good relationship with Patrick Vieira, didn't you? Yeah, I used to get a stick off a lot of lads at the city. We had a bit of a son and dad relationship kind of thing. Um, he really did um, have a soft spot for me, I think, looking back now. And I just respected him so much, obviously, growing up watching him and how much it was so weird at the time when he was our manager because I'm just a lad from Gorton. So to see Patrick Vieira and my uncles and people like that, I used to admire him. So for me, um, that was probably one of the best, well, he was the best manager I've, I've ever had, and it will probably take a bit of beating to have a better manager than Patrick Vieira. Well, he's won everything in the game as well, hasn't he? I mean, yeah. He's done it all, hasn't he, Patrick Vieira? He's in America yeah. now. Has he, has he got one of the, is he managing the team in America now, Patrick Vieira? No, he's in, he's in France. He manages Nice, I think. Oh, is he? Oh, he moved over yeah, there. Yeah, so he's, he's over there. But um, right. he just put a lot of trust in me at a young age, so I just um, I, he put me captain for the reserve, the EDS team at the time, Elite Development Squad, when I was 17, and there was a lot of experience pros in there. We had Marcus Lopez, we had other players, and he put me as captain, and for me, that was like a big kind of pressure on my shoulder, but it helped me so much because, obviously, it's put me into the man I am today. So we, we was, what was this youth team like? I mean, I know there's a lot of, in the academies, they say it's not about the success of the team, don't it's about bringing players through and, uh, and, getting, and getting there, and I get all that. I still believe yeah. that if you've got good players, you, you, you'll win more matches. I still think there's an element of that in whatever standard of football it is. But, but how successful was, was that team at City that you went through with? Was it a decent team? Well, very, yeah. We're just unfortunate again with Chelsea because um, their team was unbelievable. They had the likes of Tammy Abraham, um, Charlie Colker, Ola Aina, um, Charlie Masonda, um, so many players that they had. Um, but we... We had a very good team. We had um, me, Brandon Barker, um, quite a few lads, to be fair, obviously. Um, but we got to the FA Youth Cup final and um, we just kind of knew it was going to be very, very tough to beat this team in front of us because it was, it was very good and on paper better than us. But we, we tried our best, um, but unfortunately we just couldn't, we didn't have enough to beat them. Was that a two-legged? That's a two-legs, is it? In fact? Yeah, it was two-legs, yeah. Um, so we played at home at the new CFA um, the first leg of the final it was live on ITV and then we went to Stamford Bridge. Um, I think it was 3-1. We, we lost at home and then away we lost 2-1. We got an early goal and we thought we could maybe get back in the game, but it just wasn't to be. So uh, you got you played for England School Boys as well, didn't you? Let's not forget yeah. it. Did you captain England School Boys? Um, no, I never captained England, no. You played, played from a different age groups, didn't you? Yeah. I played I mean, from under 16, so it was my first tournament to under 20s. I mean, just going, just going back again, just going back to school a little bit. I'll say, well, you played some football. We were discussing the other day that we think there's a few of you who probably, we never know for certain, who must hold the record for the number of games played for Wright Robinson. So you're playing all for Wright Robinson. You, you've got all your academy stuff going on. You've got your England games going on. I mean, you must, you must have been tight. <laughs> you must have got um, Yeah, but, but at, at that age, I think it was now, I won't be able to do it. I feel like an old man already, but... Um... <laughs> At the time, you're just enjoying football and it's the best thing you can do because it's it just gives you this freedom, you feel happy, you're out playing with your friends, so whether it's at school, at City, at England. And for me, it was kind of like I was going home and I was making my family proud and that was one of the main things. Even at such a young age, my family was travelling to France to watch me play for England and it was just amazing, amazing times. I can remember at school in year 11, I can remember it must have been a Wednesday evening coming in, seeing Mr Alshaw come back into the, into the change rooms and me saying to him, Keon's not been training, has he? And he said, yeah, yeah. He said, I can't keep him away. I said, I said, I hope the FA have got a spy out on, on those four Gs. I said, we'll be getting a fine. Because you, you just, yeah. every training session, every match, you, you, you couldn't get enough of it, could you? Yeah, I just, I just literally lived and breathed the game at, um, at school. I just had this, like, fire to just always want to be, whether it was on the mugger at school or whether it was on... Turf at home with my, my little brother or whoever it would be. I just loved football and since a young age, that's always been the case. And I think that's what's kind of driven me to get to the point I'm at now. Whereas a lot of people, 
kind of don't have the dedication to to make it to the level that I've got to. Um, I don't know what the reasons are for that for other people. I can't speak for them. But for me, it was always had that burning thing inside. It was on the mugger. I always wanted to win, whether it was playing in just a local game. I always wanted to win. And I think that's what you've got to have. You've got to have this desire to kind of get whatever it is in life. You always have to have a desire to win and you've got to put everything into it. And you know what? I'm not to say this now because we're talking on Zoom, but and you had that desire, but you had it, it was in control as well, wasn't it? You weren't, I don't remember you ever getting sent off from as far as I can remember for school, particularly. It was always, you always had it channeled in, didn't you? Yeah, well, I was a captain um, and obviously I think I was one of the only players that missed house or maybe speak to on a level of kind of a man at such a young age because I feel like I was very mature for my age. Um, there was a lot of my friends that wasn't mature. Um, so kind of I put the word in for them and said, like, listen, lads, it's kind of, it's serious time now. We need to win this game. Or I just felt like I was kind of the voice for the group. Um, and a lot of the lads didn't like how close it was with Mr. House or, but I think it was just a more of me getting the point across to the lads without him having to tell them. And they think they respected it a bit more coming from one of the lads. I think it's interesting. I think, and I don't know, you, you know, you, you made this with me, but at every level of football, there is that conduit or that link, isn't there, between the managers and the players. You need somebody who, who, can, who, who, is, who has a bit of a common ground, who can get a message sometimes that the manager can't get to the players. Do you, do you find that still now in the professional game? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, for example, I can speak on behalf of Sheffield United. Um, uh, the lads like Billy Sharp and the captains, you have your leaders, Phil Jagielkas, that will kind of, if something's going on outside of football, in football, they will always kind of report to the lads personally rather than the, the management staff. So what, they've obviously got a bigger pressure on the shoulders because it's not just the football they have to deal with, it's other media duties and things like that and getting tickets sorted and other things. So I feel like as a young lad looking at them and what they do, I always, I've always seen myself as a captain. So hopefully one day with look, looking at the experience that they've kind of given me and what they have to do, it will help me. Yeah, and you know what? People <clears throat> who've not been involved in the game like yourself probably don't realise all those different aspects of that job. You know, they, they'll think they, they just leave the team out on a match day and, and that's it. They put the armband on, they sort the, the handshakes out, but there's a lot more goes on, isn't there, in, in any football club? Yeah, definitely. There's, there's, and you realise at the moment you sign that first professional contract when it comes real, real life because you're not just playing for fun anymore. It's more this pressure. You're getting paid money. You getting you have to play for your next contract, and there's a lot of pressure going on um, outside of football. It could be you could have family problems, but no one outside would ever know that. You just want your over that white line. You just have to perform, and it is difficult at times, but it's the best job in the world. So you have to deal with both. Kind of situations. Yeah. So, <clears throat> for to ask you a question, you have not to put you on the spot. Then it, this is a tricky question. Who's the best youth team player that got released that you can think? I mean, that's a that's just for the kids who get released from clubs because sometimes they get released and they think that's it. The, the, the end of the world is near, and that's it's all over for me. But we see as teachers a lot of students that have been released when they were younger come again and end up carving careers out. Who's the best player that you've seen that's been released that you think well he was a player? Um. I would have to say 100% David Brooks. You'll know him who's at Bournemouth. Right, yeah. So he was with us from, he signed at six, seven years old. So he was in the, like the star groups, whatever they call them. Um, he was there. He was there until 16. And then that's when you get your decision whether you're going to get the scholarship. And he wasn't one of the players that got taken on. He was very small at the time. So a lot of the lads at City was big or in any football team. It was more yeah. about size. And he was very small, but technically always the best. So we always had something. That's why I was at City. But he, um, he just never grew in City, seeing that as a, a disadvantage for him. But look at him now. He's by far out of our year, out of our age group from City, the best player and yeah. has the best achievement. So for me, I was playing every game at City. I was at this level. And then suddenly I have to go out on loan and things like this. Whereas he's done it the opposite. He got released. Then he's gone on to Sheffield and worked his way through their academy. And then he's gone on to Bournemouth for... £20 million or whatever it was. Fair play, fair play to you, mate. People like that, who, that's what you've got to have, haven't you? I say this to the young people at school, to the students, you've got to have resilience, you've got to have that bounce back and yeah. that type of thing. You know, you can that, still have that desire like you talked about earlier. Yeah, definitely. You're, you're going to have setbacks in football, just like anything in life. I feel like there's, there's setbacks with every job. Um, but with David Brooks, especially, um, he was a shy lad as well. So for him to get to that point now where he's playing internationally for his country to play every week in the Premier League. It's, it's an unbelievable 
achievement from him because that must have took a lot of hard work to get his body built up to deal with the man's physical game. Fair play to me. So, go on then, Alan. So, we've had that one. Top player that got released. Top three players you've, you've, you've trained with at City because you must have trained with some superstars all the time. Yeah, and there's a, there's a lot to choose from because obviously over the time there was... When I first went to train with the first team, it was Roberto Mancini. I remember I was at home, it was Christmas time, so obviously I was off school. And a lot of the foreign lads go back to Spain or wherever they, they live. So a local lad, and it, luckily it was me that got called in to go and train with the first team. I was 14 at the time. And it was Mario Balotelli, Mika Richards, James Milner, Joe Hart, all these players and superstars. And I was at home one day in got and the next minute I'm training with these superstars. So it was just crazy for me. But overall, looking back, I'd have to say Vincent Company. Um would be top of the list probably just because every training session he was always 100% no matter what he'd always let you know whether he was a young lad or he was Joe Hart one of his best mates he'd say the same things and give you criticism or positives when needed um, technically David Silver was he's, he was just special he was he just floated and literally he would be in front of you one second next minute he'd be behind you on the half turn scoring um, it was just crazy and then I'd have to go between De Bruyne and Sterling for the last one. Um, I think people would get an image of Sterling that he kind of doesn't train well. I just feel like he's got that image, but he'd always give everything in training. From the minute I met him, he took me on. Um, I think that's because I was obviously an English lad and there wasn't many English lads out there at City at the time. So he kind of, I think it works for him nice that I was English and he could kind of speak to me. And then De Bruyne, obviously everyone knows Kevin De Bruyne is, is special, so... To train with players like that, it's just looking back, it's, it's some, I have some pictures on my phone and sometimes I just look and think how fortunate I was to share a pitch with them players. Yeah, yeah, but listen, you weren't it, you did the right things, Kian, that's why you got there, but just on that, your first training session with all these big, big names, I mean, I've spoken to different people over many different people over the years and often have different stories. Some people say to me that one day they're training down with the youth team, the manager needs a couple of extra players up with the first team. They, they ring down, next thing you know, you've, you've had no preparation, you're up with the first team training with all these superstars. How did it work for you? Did you know you were going to be training with these players? Did you have a sleepless night the night before? Or was it sprung upon you in a training session? Well, for that one time when it was it was my first session, um, it was the day before I got a phone call of my under 14s manager at the time. Um, I think his name was Simon Davis, who played United. He gave me a message and just basically said, um, Carrington tomorrow um, sent the time and I got I had, I had a driver to pick me up and bring me to training. By the time, I was just like so nervous, happy, telling the mum running downstairs and I was like, I'm training with the first team. And that's at that age, obviously, a lot of my family is City fans. So for me to tell them that I'm going in training with City and it's I literally live across the road from it, it was, it was crazy. But it was some of the best, well, by far the best times in my life to train with players like that. Brilliant. So you had good years at City, you know, you probably had the, some of the best development that you could get. And then you, you, while you're there, you're, you're loaned out to Oldham. Um, yeah. you, killed, you killed my dreams on Saturday. You beat us at, at Boundary Park. Obviously, I'm a Black and Rollers fan. I, re I remember that. I remember that. You were texting me before the game, but you didn't text me after. <laughs> I was sick. Um, but, but one thing that I must say, that, and this is what some of the kids have said to me at school that we've noticed, when we've been around these national finals and in these big games, obviously you get allocated dressing rooms. And the massive the, the difference between the home dressing room and the away dressing room yeah. is unbelievable. And lots of people probably wouldn't appreciate that. I mean, I'm not being critical of Stoke City here, but we, we, we played a final at Stoke not, um, not long ago and we got the away dressing room. And it, you couldn't swing a cat in it. There was, there was no room in it. So you yeah, well, funny enough, that's where our last promotion game was for Sheffield. So I was there. So I've seen their dressing room. And uh, yeah, it is very it's tiny, yeah. So you wouldn't rather get all the gear in. So what was it like going from from, from a Man City and dealing in that setup to playing it with Oldham and going around the grounds that you went to with Oldham? Um, I feel like it was a very a very good moment in my career for me to to witness real football, real situations, not all fancy and not all glamour. Um, I was you used to have to drive to train, so you drive to the stadium to get trains, and you could jump back in your car and drive to the training ground. So it was completely different. Whereas that city, it was, you go in, you have your breakfast, your kit's clean, you're there. Whereas that old, everything was just completely the different end of the scale. Um, but it was probably the best football I've played. So 
it's just kind of, it gets that nitty gritty side of you. And I think you need that in football, especially because for me, I was at that level where I was at the top training with them players and, and suddenly I'm playing in League One. But for me, I just need the experience. I was young um, and I played very good football. I was enjoying my football. Um, so yeah, I just really enjoyed my time there. I'll tell you what, you played well. I mean, you played well in the two games against us and then from there, though, you, you end up that it, it works for you, doesn't it? Because you get a good move to Sheffield United, don't you? So yeah. there's a lesson to any young footballer. You've got to back yourself, haven't you? If you get if you get an opportunity to go out on loan and prove yourself, why not back yourself and take that opportunity? Yeah, definitely. And the thing is that City and the, the development squads now, they have 123. So they play and it's to a level, but it's not to a level where you're playing for three points every week and it's, it's real life situations and... If people get relegated, money differs and things like that. So it's real life. It's, real, it's a real life situation. So for me to get thrown in the deep end at Oldham, it was it was very good. And like you said, I got a move off the back of it. So I feel like sometimes a step back and taking steps forward. Um, so you just have to kind of be patient and believe in yourself. I think that's a message to <clears throat> to the students that are listening in all aspects of life. That I think you, that's you know that is a good life message. So you get the move to Sheffield United. It's a great move, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, gives you a bit more security. Really pleased with that, yeah. Yeah, I was I was buzzing at the time. I had um I had quite a bit of interest to be fair because obviously I played a lot of games at Oldham and at the time I was twenty one, so I was a young lad coming through, just been at City at a good team. So it was it was pressure on me that year at Oldham to play well because I only had a year left at City after that. So I was going into the season thinking I have to play, I have to play well. So I put that pressure on myself. Unfortunately, it worked and. I got this move to Sheffield United and they obviously, the year before I signed, they was pushing for promotion. They'd just been promoted from League One to the Championship, but obviously the manager was was very good and nobody realised how good the team was that they had. Obviously it's shown now, but um, when, it, when I went there, it was just, it was amazing to train with some of the players that was there also because they'd been in League One and worked their way up. So they was opposite end of the scale from at City. So it's good to see both sides, but some of the talent there is, is unbelievable. But it's another big city club, isn't it? Big fan base, yeah. strong support. So, you know, it must be great when you're playing for a team that's taking big numbers away from home and things like that. Um, I've got to say, I watched you play for, I've, I've, well, I've watched you play a few times for, for various clubs when you played against my old team, but I watched you play in a, in a back three in a cup match. It was you, Jack Rodwell, he's got three caps for England, and Phil Jagielka with 40 caps for England. But what's that like, playing in the back three like that? Just the lad from right, I'll be playing with them, eh? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was, to be fair, I got a few messages after the game from my family, because they, my family obviously, like me, they've just been growing up around these areas, so it's to see one of their family members to play with these these players is special for them as well. So when I get messy off them, it makes me realise sometimes I have to pinch myself and realise how lucky I am that I'm getting this opportunity to play with players like Phil Jagiel, who played hundreds of games in the Premier League. He's, like you just said, he's had 40 caps for his country. It's it's unbelievable. And I'm just sat there next to him and passing the ball to him. It's, it's unbelievable at times. But um, it was a great day for me, to be fair. That I enjoyed it. Yeah. So, um, it's all going well. Then, then now you've had a bit of a long spell at Bolton. Which has uh, reunited you with another ex Robinson Robinson student, haven't you? Joe Bunny's at Bolton as well, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, Bunster. Um, <laughs> he's a great lad. Um, he's, he had a different, obviously, way into football than me. He started off at the lower leagues, but he works his way up. And I can see why, because he's just, he's a grafter. He works hard. He knows his abilities. He sticks to them. He, he's always first in training. He's last out. So he's one of them players that I think people don't respect, but. He's good to have in the team. He's a great, great left foot. He's still got a great left foot, yeah? Yeah, he's got, he's, he's got, he's got a great left peg, to be fair to him. He's, um, but like I said, he's just a good lad. I think that's what makes Joe Bunny. He's, he's great for the changing room. He's great for the managers love him. He's played a lot of games in the league now, and I think that shows just how good of a lad he is. I'll tell you what, when you're all a bit old, we won't have a bad old boys team, will we? We'll be able to win a, <clears throat> win a few, few cups with an old boys team, I should imagine. Yeah, there'll be a few. <laughs> Okay, right. So I'm conscious I've been taking quite a bit of time now. So we've got some some questions now from some of the students that they've sent in on the internet. I'll um, I think some of them we've answered already, but I'll have a look through the list. We had a, 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 Angelo and Brad both sent a question, which is similar. We know you started your career, but um, what helped you motivate you and push you towards the career that you've that you've got? Um, it's a bit of a cliche, but I'd have to say my family because for me growing up, it was sometimes times were tough so I always had them to look at and they had that motivation every time I went out especially at the level when I got my first professional deal um, to 
always have that drive in me to get to that next level because at that time I would I could see what what was in it for me if I, if I did reach my potential so for me it was always looking at my family and thinking I've got to make them proud. The, um, I mean I've got one here this is it, it... This is a, 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 a possibly a question based on stereotype, and it, it certainly doesn't apply to you. He said, "Did you struggle in school, um, and do you feel that the football held you back in any way?" But you didn't at all, did you? No, not not really. Um, I loved school, to be fair. Um, and you got at the time, GCC, at the time, something like that. More than that, how many GCSEs did you get? Pardon? You got quite a few GCSEs out of it as well in the end, didn't you? Yeah, well, I did. Well, it was a different situation for me because I was in obviously I was at City for two two days of the week, so. For me, I always had to, when I was in school, I always had to stay the extra hour or in earlier yeah. to do extra work. So for me, it was the case of just when I was in school, getting my head down and focusing on what I needed to do to get them GCSEs because I realised how important they was to me. Was, I always had football, but if anything can happen in life, you don't know. So to have them GCSEs with you for the rest of your life is so important. You did well, I did the research. You got the equivalent of 10 GCSEs, though. Uh, that, that you did very well, didn't you? So you, yeah, you got Brain in there somewhere. <laughs> okay, as we're, we're moving towards the end now. Okay, I'm, Mr. Alshaw's texting as, he, as you'd expect while we're going on. I said, Do you yeah. remember the goal you scored away at Liverpool when everybody went berserk? I mean, I don't know what game he's, he's, he's referring to. Would you remember that? <laughs> um, I scored quite a few over my time, to be fair. Um, but the scouts, <laughs> I should remember that. I'm not, I can't remember it. There'll be a few, won't there? Yeah. Okay. Um, now, I've just got, a, just got a couple more questions on, on the uh, on the foot somebody sent me through last night because Mr. Hibbert asked me a question for you. Yeah. Good question, this as well. Or well, actually, Josh, this one's off Josh first, so Josh Papula. What was your favourite sporting moment from your time at school, your favourite sporting moment? I'd have to say scoring at the Etihad, the hat-trick, um, because it was a special day for me and my family. Um, but there was also another memory, I remember it, we played on the Asher turf, obviously at school, and all the our year group was allowed out to watch the game. So you had everyone watching, you know, all the teachers, the majority of the school, and we was playing the Scousers, and we got a free kick towards the end of the game, and I scored the free kick, and I've run off like crazy and celebrating with everyone, and it was it was a very good moment and special. You used to have, you used to have some good games against uh, Colonel Heenan and the like. There were some good players, yeah. and some good strong teams, didn't they? Over yeah, they, they, had, they had a lot of lads at Everton at Liverpool. Yeah, so some strong teams. Big. Uh, one from Mr Hibbert here. What advice would you give to any students who are currently playing at academies in terms of managing their academic and sporting commitments and managing their expectations? For me, most important is to put your schoolwork before football because at that age, you never know what is going to happen. Um, whether you're in year seven or year 11 and you're a bit more experienced with what you're kind of going to do in life. But for me, I had Mr Hibbert as a mentor from when I was doing my day release at City. So I think I owe him a lot because when I used to come back into school, he would stay extra hours with me at lunchtime, at dinner times. He was always, he'd always be there for me. And he didn't have to do that, even though we obviously had a job to do with me, but he always was on to me to do extra work and to help me through it. Because sometimes as kids, you don't understand some of the work that you've been given and you don't really want to ask your teacher because you might feel a bit, obliged to but I feel like Mr Hibbert was one of the people you could always speak to and he'd always give you an honest kind of opinion on what he thinks is important for you and at that time football was very important but not as important as, as school so you've just got to make sure that all your school work's complete and um, your homework and doing maybe extra things at home as well to make sure that you're on top of your work. And fair play to you for mentioning that because you know <clears throat> from my perspective now that was the head teacher there's lots of staff in school who who do work behind the scenes that, that, that like that's like in football that people will have absolutely no awareness yeah. of no idea what's yeah. going on it's yeah and Danny stuff. Danny for me was I still speak to him now and we've always had that relationship because I, when I was at primary school he used to play against his primary school so before coming to the school I, I, I knew Danny um Mr Herbert should I say so when I come in it was it was someone that I could kind of lean on and for me it was hard because I was doing maybe 50% less of the, the lessons that the other lads was doing and all, all, all the rest of the year. So for me, when I was in school, I, I needed to make sure that that time was used correctly. So sometimes I'd miss dinner times to make sure I was getting the work done and need always be there to help me. So I was just very fortunate to have someone like that there. <clears throat> fair play, but also message to the students, fair play to you as well, because you took the time out to make the time up. You know what I mean? You yeah. 
you say yourself. And at, at that time, you 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 got it because maybe you miss a break time, which is twenty minutes a day. But that twenty minutes of the day could get you an extra lesson because it's it's one to one. So them lesson for me was vitally important when when I was coming into school, hundred percent. And then that goes back to what you said earlier about making the sacrifices. And obviously, you get what you deserve in life. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a firm believer yeah. in that. And you're getting what you deserve in life. Mrs. Howard asked me to ask you a question because it's relevant to PE because of the, the, the you know the environment that we're in at the minute coming to sports presentation even <clears throat> regarding a, a variety of sports at school. You know because obviously you, you're you're a great footballer, you're Premier League footballer, but you didn't just play football, did you? No, I played I played a lot of sports in school, and I think it's so important because. You just never know what you're going to enjoy and what you're going to love and what's going to give you that freedom. Of, like now I play tennis outside of football with my friends um, and I just feel like sometimes it's, it's so important to have a different option sometimes. And for me, I played rugby. I, I did running one day, um, played for the athletics team. And I just used to love doing lo lots of different sports. We had table tennis, which was, comp was at dinner times and stuff. So I feel like it's just important to get involved in as many sports as you can. Just, just brings me on to a quick five, quick quiet questions here, just as a bit of fun. Okay, it's just, a, you just pick one or the other. <clears throat> so we go tennis or golf? Tennis. Sweet or savoury? Sorry? Sweet or savoury? Sweet. Cod or FIFA? FIFA. Airpods or Beats? Airpods. Your mum's cooking or Brooks cooking? No, I'm only joking. Don't answer that one, Keanu. I'm joking. Don't answer that one. I was okay. about to say that one. <laughs> I'm just pulling you like, okay. So last question, big question this. And it's a big question for, for me as the head. I'll probably be showing this to the incoming year sixes. So what would the 23-year-old Kian Bryan say to the Kian Bryan who's 11 years old and he's just about to start Ryan Robinson College? For me, I would say enjoy every single moment you walk through them gates at school because at the time... You can't wait for lesson to finish. You can't wait for home time. You can't wait for that bell to ring. But once you leave that school, you will never get a chance to go back. So when I got when it, when you messaged me, I was speaking to a couple of friends about um, doing this this Zoom call and this YouTube live, and they were, was bringing back so many memories from school, whether it was in classrooms together or whether it was getting a bus to school together. I just feel like you don't appreciate at the time when what's going on until you've left. Because if I could go back now, I'd go back in a heartbeat. It was, it was just such good times for me. Um, and I was just very fortunate that I had a good group of friends around me. I had good teachers and I appreciate everything that went on at Wright Robinson College. Kian, you've always been different class, okay? And uh, you get everything that you deserve out of life. So no doubt you'll continue to be different class. We'll be calling on you again, as we always do. We seem to take up more of your time than anybody else, I suppose. But uh, that's what happens when you're such a good ambassador for the school and you're you know, such a fine, outstanding person as you are. So thank you very much. No problem. Just a quick one before I go. Um, when is the sports presentation? It's going to be next Sorry, next week. I'll, I'll, I'll say you, you give me a good prop there. Because we've had to cancel the evening, so next week what we're going to do, and this goes out to all the students, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday, we're going to release different year groups uh, on the social media platforms, what, what awards they've won. So Monday will be year seven, Tuesday year eight, Wednesday year nine, Thursday year ten, and then on Friday uh, we'll, we'll we'll release the year eleven awards, and we will also announce who's going to follow you up onto the board with the names on the board and give me awarded school colours. So uh, everybody out there, keep your eyes eyes peeled on social media. We've got lots of video clips going out uh, to recognise uh, everything that's gone on, even though unfortunately. We've not seen a lot of M product this season because we've got to be yeah. in the national final again this year. Would you believe? And obviously that that's that's that at the moment. Well, I, I was just going to say I have um I have some shirts at home and some football boots. So if you would like to organise with the school a raffle or something like that for the for the school colours winner or winners of the, the the awards, then I'm happily to bring them in once obviously all this has kind of ended and get them to the to the students. Oh, that's different class, Kian. So we'll be in touch about that then. Definitely, that's different. No problem. Class. Very much. No okay, so make the best of lockdown. You take care of yeah, yourself and the family. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. See you bye. Bye. bye.